Good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Mike Miano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network, and it is my privilege to be here with you with a, for our daily Preterist Power Hour that we do Monday through Friday. Uh, we usually do it at 11 a.m., and we usually do it Monday through Friday. Obviously, this week we took a hiatus because of the holiday, President's Day. We do hope that uh, you, you had opportunity yesterday to think through positive thoughts in regards to President's past, present, and or future, uh, those things that we might hope for uh, in the presidency in some way. So uh, I am I was grateful for the time away. Edward, I missed you, brother. Well, I, I get the privilege to fellowship with you often. However, I missed doing our Preterist Power Hour and uh, being here. So good morning to you. And I want to go ahead and hand it over to you and let you introduce yourself and lead us in on a word of prayer. Good morning. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church. And <clears throat> Uh, it's an honor and pr privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano on his prayer power hour. Uh, now I'd like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have together for this prayer power hour. Thank you for the guests we have today. And also uh, just, you know, thank you for the, for the people, for the listeners that we have, the ones that we have often and the new listeners that they may, uh, glean from what would be discussed this morning, uh, that Pastor and Tim Martin would be uh, graced with clarity of thought, focus, proper focus, that we may, you know, receive it with clarity, that we may uh, receive enough information that we may discuss it with others, develop fellowship, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, another hearf, uh, hearty prayer there, brother. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, I don't know about you, Edward, but I, I have a little bit of thoughts that I want to share uh, coming out of last week. You know, again, uh, one thing I have to say is looking at our social media, many people are interested in this conversation. Uh, many have thanked me for opening up a forum where we can look at and further discuss some of the things that have been outlined. As many of us know, it's, there's a big difference between reading an article uh, or Facebook comments versus actually hearing conversation. Uh, developing these things, or even just the voice uh, explaining some of these things. So uh, I'm very grateful that we've been doing this. I know many have said that they need to go back and re-listen to a lot of the podcasts because we've been unearthing a lot in regards to a healthy look at the book of Genesis. Uh, I'm excited to say that we have Tim Martin with us again today, of course. Uh, Tim, good morning to you. And uh, before we bring you on, I just have a couple of things, as I had mentioned, I want to share, but wanted to go ahead and thank you and uh, say good morning to you as well. Thank you. Good morning, Michael and, and Edward. It's good to be back on. Yes, amen. And, uh, you know, so again, I'm looking forward to a, a very uh, power packed show, if you will. Uh, however, Edward, if you don't mind, uh, before I want to let you share some things, if you have some thoughts, but I also want to take the liberty to share some of my own uh, following you. Okay, sure. It, it, it was a wonderful experience uh, with Tim explaining, you know, the seven days, you know, uh, and creation. The word creation, uh, meaning, in, in a way, in a way, refurbished or or uh, um, um, renewed, fixed, restored, re, right, new, restored. You know what what already had existed, like what God had already created previously. You know, so uh, I thought that was an excellent thing. And then the seven days of basically what they had meant, and and on the seventh day, how. The first six days spoke of morning and evening and morning, and on the seventh day it had not, and how it referred to like uh, uh, Genesis 22, where it talks about um, uh, God will eliminate, rather illuminate, uh, there will be no need for the sun, or, you know, or light of the sun, because God will illuminate it, and on the seventh day, it was no morning or 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 evening that shows that uh the sabbath was you know eternal you know the rest the rest was eternal and then god did not uh stop working on the sabbath you know he 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 continued to to do good things because jesus as an example uh when he healed on the seventh on the sabbath and stuff like that you know people couldn't understand but yet you know when he when he spoke of that the father was was still working and he was still working. In other words, that work work 
goes on. Doing good deeds, doing good things go, goes on. And for us that, that, that are found in God's rest, we're to do the same as Jesus did, you know, in God's rest, as far as, you know, continuing to do good deeds, to continue to do good, you know, our work goes on. Amen. And, you know, I have to say, Amen. I, appreciated, Amen, Edward. I appreciated that exhortation. Edward actually mentioned that at the uh, Blue Point Bible Church this past uh, Sunday, uh, gave an exhortation, summing up some thoughts in regards to the Sabbath. And I appreciated that. And I think you brought out some good points there. Uh, obviously, that's an encouragement for people to go back and listen to those programs to further see how that that train of thought and that that frame of uh, reference was being developed. So I want to encourage everyone to go back to the resources. Uh, if you don't mind, I just want to share a couple other things. Uh, one thing I'll say is, obviously, as I go through my weekend, I often have to, you know, I say to myself, you know, what is the power of preterism? This is a weekly program. I find myself constantly referring to it and talking about it with people. So uh, my beautiful fiance reminded me of something that I said to her a year ago yesterday. And it was this, that we are the salt of the earth. They are here to bring out the flavors of God. And she had quoted that on social media and quoted me. Uh, however, that's not me. That's Jesus. And that's Jesus in Matthew chapter five, particularly uh, some of us might be familiar with the message Bible. And I've, I always bring this up. You know, the message Bible is not a translation that I use very much in my study. However, I believe in, in this regard uh, here in Matthew chapter five, particularly pertaining to the salt of the earth. I think Eugene Peterson did a good job of uh, outlining what Jesus was sort of saying here, getting at in a contemporary way. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16. Uh, from the Message Bible. It says, let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be the salt seasoning that brings out God's flavors on this earth. If you lose out, if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your youth usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be a light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, don't you think I am going to, do you think I'm going to hide you under a bucket? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on the hilltop on a light stand, shine, keep open house, be generous with your lives, be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous father in heaven. And as I read that, I think that's the power of preterism. That's what we're getting at, is being the people of God that are bringing out the message, the mission, the will of God uh, in the earth. And uh, one last quote in that regard was from N.T. Wright. It was on my time hop this morning. And uh, those of you that know my testimony to Tuesday, throwback Thursday ethic, it's always to be uh, reflecting on things that I've posted throughout the years and, and asking myself, where have I grown? Where has this applied? How has it been beneficial? And N.T. Wright, uh, again, not a full preterist. However, he does have uh, some thoughts that lean in on a good ethic. And he had once said, uh, Jesus's resurrection is the beginning of God's new project not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. And again, that's my testimony. Yeah. To, to be those and amen. that's good stuff. Yeah. Amen. You know, and I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, Don K. Preston is actually doing a series. He's been doing it for a while, undoing some of, let's say, the confusion that N.T. Wright seems to have in regards to resurrection and uh, what God's full picture of his restoration is. So um, I, I just I want to lift that up as a testimony Tuesday. And two last thoughts I'll bring up that came to mind as we went through this past weekend. Uh, one being that the 20th Sunday was actually National Leadership Day. And we had, uh, if I may just tell you what National Leadership Day is, it's a day set aside to acknowledge the power of leadership. Every year on February 20th, we recognize the impact that leaders make in people's lives as they seek to develop themselves and others. And I say this because just two weeks ago, we had done an entire week of talking about leadership here on the Preterist Power Hour. We have two resources that you can obtain by going to the power of preterism.wordpress.com, one being leadership, vision, and the Preterist movement. And we put a host of different resources for you to continue to develop your leadership uh, in your own life and also if you're leading others. And then also we had a great conversation with Deacon Ed Silsby here from the Blue Point Bible Church in regards to stewardship, which again is a part of our leader 
relationship and uh, being servants. And we talked about that and we have a bunch of resources in that regard. So uh, that's available for you. I, I thought about it on Sunday. I said oh, that that needs to be highlighted and brought up. So I appreciate the opportunity to do so this morning. And one last thought, as I'm mentioning weekends, uh, one of my burdens and inspirations is to create a resource for the preterist community for what I'm calling preterist weekends. And ultimately, it's going to be studies, sermons, fellowships, and other worship opportunities that preterists can have as they go through the weekend. We do a program, or at least try to do a program almost every day of the week, uh, except for the weekends. So uh, some of those things might include, uh, there's currently a Facebook group that you can join called Preterist Churches uh, that we're continuing to work on and develop. Uh, that group is run by a woman named Dr. Cindy Coates, who serves as the pastor of The Porch in Marietta, Georgia. And you can actually watch their worship services on The Porch at face on Facebook. Uh, they have a Facebook page for The Porch. Uh, if you go to the Preterist Church's Facebook page, you'll find that resource. And then, of course, Jonathan Butchery, who's one of our directors of the Power of Preterism Network, he serves as pastor of Holston PBU Church, and they regularly post their sermons. I, matter of fact, this week was able to listen to two resources from Jonathan Butchery, both his uh, Wooden Pulpit podcast, where he highlighted the conference that I'll be speaking at in March, and then also his sermon, where he's been going through a sermon series talking about healthy churches and uh, contrasting that with cult churches. And uh, I thought it was a very good series and good thoughts shared in that regard. And then of course, here at the Blue Point Bible Church, we regularly uh, post our worship services and Bible studies. And I'm always sharing different things on our Facebook page, on our website at bluepointbiblechurch.org. And uh, Edward, I even know that you and I have been in dialogue in regards to you creating a resource that might be beneficial to people through the weekend, as you obviously are involved in quite a few of our studies. So uh, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that or if you want me to mention it. And then uh, after that, we'll go ahead and welcome uh, Tim on the program. You mention it, please. All right, cool. Well, I'm excited that, you know, Edward and I have been doing some dialogue. And what I've learned about Edward is he listens well, he's diligent, he desires to comprehend and then share. So uh, what we're looking to do is help him uh, develop a blog site where he'll be all the different books and studies and resources that he's involved with. When he has inspiration, he'll provide written reviews on his blog site and perfectly short videos for people to be edified. And I've found that to be very beneficial in Edward's uh, life and calling, and I've been benefited by it. Matter of fact, I appreciated your notes on the sermon this past Sunday, uh, seemed to correlate pretty well with mine. Uh, so uh, that being said, you know, I look forward to making that a resource that people will be able to glean from, and we'll develop the blog site and share more about that as we go through the week. Uh, matter of fact, maybe next week will be a great week to talk about that because what we're hoping to do next Monday is begin a conversation here for the whole week where we're going to talk about preterism and the church. And uh, we're going to have some interviews and discussion in that regard. So uh, look forward to next week's program. However, we're here today, this week, and uh, we're continuing our conversation about preterism and the Genesis creation. So again, Tim, I'm grateful that you're here with us this morning. And uh, we've made many resources available at thepowerofpreterism.wordpress.com in this conversation, uh, already available for people. So we encourage you to go over there. However, Tim, uh, you're here with us today. I know we're going to benefit much. Good morning, and please uh, lean in on our discussion here. Yeah, good morning, Michael. I, I think it's ironic you mentioned Eugene Peterson and the message, and I've uh, been a big fan of that uh, for devotional reading the same hmm. on the same lines of what you suggest. And I've actually read all of the pastoral books that Eugene Peterson wrote, um, and uh, they're fantastic. And a lot of people don't realize this, but Eugene Peterson is a native of Montana here. So he was born and raised in Montana, and then he retired in Montana before he passed away just recently. So interesting connection to my neck of the woods. And I actually got to see him one time in person at a conference and and uh, was fantastic conversation. So um, neat stuff. Interesting how those connections, of course, N.T. Wright as well. But um, I was blown away at last week's conversation, Michael. I hope you guys enjoyed that as, as much as I did. Um, there's just was some fantastic presentations there. And uh, especially with Randy coming along and doing his two presentations. So what I had in mind today was maybe maybe pick up kind of uh, where Randy left off. So if you haven't listened to, to Randy's two presentations previous to this, it might be helpful to, to start there. But I thought that Randy did such a great job of explaining and introducing some concepts that are so big that um, 
I'd like to just kind of carry on with that for a bit and uh, see where that takes us. And then maybe we you know, need to do more shows and get more into the details of uh, where I'd like to end up is Genesis 2 and 3, um, following up on what we discussed about Genesis 1 last week. So does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Edward, what do you think? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm eager. All right, cool. Okay. One thing I want to say, following up on my presentation on seven days, seven prophetic days of creation is, um, there's, there, there can be some easy miscommunication about what that means, and I was asked in, in a discussion forum if I had any resources about you know, where I'm getting this material from, if somebody put this together, and, and I had to explain to that individual that there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing put together that I was presenting, but there's little pieces and snippets everywhere if you read enough people and you, you, you investigate enough stuff. You're going to find little details that are sort of interesting, and I wanted to to mention a couple of people because Norm Voss wrote our introduction to Beyond Creation Science, and Norm Voss was presenting a lot of this covenant uh, prophetic days uh, many years ago, and, and and it was controversial. In fact, Norm got tons of heat for claiming things that were just we thought were crazy back in 2006, 2007, 2008, you know, the time that we were publishing that third edition. But uh, Norm had some fantastic editions. Um, I explained to the person who was asking about that, um, that a lot of my ideas and method, which is very similar to Randy's method, actually comes from reading a guy named James B. Jordan. I don't know if anybody knows Jim Jordan and his mm -hmm books and stuff but um i read one of his books as a young teenager and it it was a transformative experience for me as a young person to to really understand the sim symbol package what i call the symbol package of scripture and how it works from beginning to end and uh, so so if you wanted to kind of understand kind of where i'm coming from uh jim jordan is probably one of the, the biggest influences in in my thinking and i wanted to to go back to those seven days for a second because I explain them as epochs or eras in covenant history, looking forward as God makes or creates his eternal temple um, coming into fulfillment ultimately in Jesus Christ and everything that we see in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, and I think I wanted, to, I wanted to clarify one thing because it's very easy to think of these covenant, individual covenants in the Old Testament as sort of individual isolated things almost like marbles in a bag you know so we got this old testament there's this grab bag of individual marbles that are all separate in fact um, my wife actually attends a dispensational premillennial church here in town uh, kind of a baptist background independent fundamental background and it was kind of interesting because just recently in her conversation with a pastor and and discussing some of the things, they realized that she wasn't, you know, she wasn't a dispensational premillennialist. So she was one of these preterists, and they had never met a preterist before. And it's like, oh my gosh, what do we have here? And they sent a book home, a couple of books home with her to kind of introduce her to dispensational premillennials. <laughs> and it was just kind of funny. She, she brought it home and said, you know, I I probably have a good book you could give back to him. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was looking through this stuff, and I haven't looked at dispensational premillennial books for for decades. But it was very evident to me that this dispensational premillennialism was all about these covenants. Of course, it's really big in dispensational thinking, but they're all disconnected, right? They're all just like there's the Abrahamic covenant, which is like central, and it sets the tone for you know the the kingdom, millennial millennial kingdom with Israel and the land with Jesus in Jerusalem physically and all that stuff. And then they got the Davidic kingly covenant over here. And, you know, it, it's like this, it's like this grab bag of marbles and they're all disconnected. And what I wanted to say is what I was presenting last week is not that it is this idea more that what we have with a progression of covenants matching the days of creation is more like a blooming rose where you have this, this start of this bud with Adam and day one, the creation of the light, separation from darkness, and you have this opening of the rose to where 
each of these petals and these progressive works of God is unfolding into one grand picture. And, and there's a term in the Old Testament where, you know, in various covenants where God says, I will establish my covenant with you and your children. And I think it's important to understand that that's not something that's in the Hebrew, the word establish doesn't really mean something brand new. It's, it's better rendered in English is I will confirm mm. my covenant with you because it's not, it's not working in isolation from the past. It's building on the past. And I think Paul talks about that in Galatians three with, you know, the covenant given to Abraham with promises is not annulled when the law is added 490 years later. Yeah, Paul's thinking there. There's this covenant promise with Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, and the law is added to that, but it doesn't like separate the law covenant and Sinai covenant from the Abrahamic promises or annul them. So when, when we talk about the seven prophetic days of creation, I, I want to really stress at the beginning that they're building on top of each other and the things that come before are incorporated into things that come later. And it is really a maturing theme uh, mm. in that God's covenant people are bring, being brought to maturity through the old covenant creation and into full and complete maturity with the coming of Jesus Christ and the new creation. Does that make sense to you, to you Michael? Yeah, I'm following along. I actually, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, uh, you, you know, again, one thing that I often highlight is the biblical narrative. I think that we need to see it as this progressive story rather than these particular details uh, in one right. place and another. So I appreciate the uh, the image there of a blooming rose and, of course, the allusion to maturity, uh, that that's what we should be see happening with the people of God from the beginning of the scriptures, uh, that, you know, it's God urging and them toward maturity. Right. So here I'll pick up kind of where, where Randy introduced stuff, and I and I actually I had to listen to Randy's two presentations more than once because he was just unloading stuff really fast. And, you know, his first one he was talking about the method that we use within you know the paradigm of covenant creation. It's very similar to the method of covenant eschatology, and um, you know what he said about deep study and you, he said you can't rush this stuff you've got to pay attention to the details of the text and um you know that really was helpful to me and it was it was interesting i, I was i was reading that those disp dispensational premillennial books the last couple of weeks and it, it was it blew my mind how these dispensational authors really never brought in the text to explain where they got their ideas from the text they were just telling people and writing people what to believe about the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Huge difference. If you read dispensational premillennialist material, pre -millennialist material see, it, it, they're really teaching you how to think about the Bible. They're not really digging into the details of the text and the stories because they all matter. And that was a real good contrast that I saw, and Randy brought that out really well. And I would add to that, that this is really ancient literature uh, that we're dealing with, and ancient literature is really an art form. Um, you know, we, we have computers, and we can sit down on our computer, and we can type up a document, right? Just prose, put out the information some way, and then say, hit the print button, you know, and out, the, out of the printer comes the document. But these ancient literature documents aren't like that. I mean, they are really tight. They are packed with information. They're, they have the symbol, symbolic aspects of it where, you know, animals signify certain things, even directions in the text. You know, uh, they, they have meaning. Colors can be symbolic in these ancient literature texts. So um, what I appreciated that about what what uh, Randy brought in is that uh, we have to really take it slow and pay attention to details. There's poetry involved, and uh, those are those are done to sort of uh, you know highlight certain things. There's chiastic structures involved, and I'm going to get into one of those hopefully today, where 
there's rhyming of ideas and and this chiastic structure goes you know, typically from A to B to C to D, which would be the center, and then backwards C B A. So so a literary structure will tell you where the middle of that of that text is, and that middle point is that hinge that the whole narrative turns on and it shows you what's important it highlights the significant things and if if the text is given for a meditative use that is where the center of focus goes for those who are reading those ancient texts so that's important to add to what to randy said it could sort of you know reinforces a lot of things he said about the method uh, that's very important and then um, in randy's second presentation he talked about some really neat stuff with uh, he talked about the uh, men and men different Hebrew words for men have different sort of covenant connotations uh, mm -hmm. all atoms are ish but not all ish are atoms yes of course uh, very yeah. important and uh, I, I'll get to that a little bit with Daniel I think Dan that's really crucial in the book of Daniel uh, Randy talked about the male and female language of creation in, in, in legal context, and he drew it out to, you know, Paul's proclamation in the New Testament that there is neither male nor female in Christ, and that's a different legal uh, a transformation in, in the New Covenant, and that was excellent. He also gave a video of, day of, a, of a sunrise on planet Earth. You remember he had that rotating globe, mm -hmm. and then they had the sun shining on that, and then he showed how in day four, the light bearers, the sun, moon, and the sun and the moon were to give light to the land, and the sea was completely absent in that that text in uh, Genesis chapter one. And and I would I would add that you know that's an excellent point because there's no sea mentioned there regarding the light. And if you remember my presentation, day four was was related to the mosaic administration and the light bearers are for the function of the sacrificial worship system. So when it says that, that the sun and the moon give light to the land, we understand that the, the law of Moses and the temple system was given to Israel to be the, to understand, to reveal the knowledge of God to Israel and not to all the nations, so that's that matches up with day four. Mm. Uh, does that make sense, Michael? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the prophetic, prophetic days there. Absolutely, and and again, I appreciate the, uh, the the point that you're making there about where we see Adam being this picture of Israel, which again is something I think is going to continue to be uh, developed. Um, I've often, uh, yeah. and you may have seen that discussion where I've talked about being in Adam and ultimately what I believe is being highlighted there. So again, I think that's important to highlight this exclusivity, if you will, uh, in regards to what God was providing to his covenant people. And that's what I see happening with day four. Right. Hey, Amen. May, may I share right. something? As Please. a student of creation, um, who, who, who would come first? Either was it Noah or at Abraham? Abraham no, uh, Noah becomes Noah, before, Noah comes before Abraham. Okay, the reason why I was asking is because it's so progressive. Like um, in 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 uh, in, in um, with with Adam, and you know the snake and all of that. Uh, uh, the snake bruising uh, Jesus' heel and Jesus uh, crushing his head and things of this nature is prophetic about Jesus Christ, and then. With uh, it, it, it's progressing up to Noah, and then after Noah's flood, um, the promise of not being destroyed, you know, the people's being destroyed, you know, in that manner, and then with Abraham's covenant, you know, how his seed would be as the stars uh, in the sky and uh, sand of the sea, um, and then it progresses to Mo to Moses to whereas you know he teaches his people. God teaches his people a way to live outside of their captivity for all of those years, you know, giving them instructions right. on how to live and letting them know that basically that, you know, 
you know, throughout that period that, you know, you can't find salvation, you know, through the law, you know, Jesus Christ, right. you know, coming into the scene, you know, um, fulfilling everything and, you know, it all progressed up until Jesus Christ. So it was all a progressive thing. They're all connected, you know, in a way, you know, so it's yeah. like, you know what, yeah. Edward, Edward, what's interesting about the unfolding of those stories is that Noah is the 10th generation from Adam. It's almost like he's a consummation man because 10 is very significant. 10 is completeness in the Bible. Yeah. And then guess what? Guess, guess, guess how many generations from Noah to Abraham? Abraham is the 10th from Noah. Wow. So even these things are actually embedded in the structure of the numbers that we see in these genealogies and therefore a purpose. Because every time you get to these eras, you have this idea that God is doing something new. Now, Randy went into Jonah, the Jonah story, right? And he made all those connections to day five where the great sea creatures and the birds are given the same blessings, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the seas, etc. Same kind of blessing that man or Adam on the land is given later in the text. But let me ask you this question. What does the name of the prophet Jonah mean? Hmm. That's good trivia there. <laughs> I'm not sure. The name Jonah means dove. Dove. Oh, wow. Wow. So, so when you see Genesis 1 and the, the mm. Spirit of God hovers over the waters, it's almost like a bird picture, right? The mm. dove plays a big role in the Noah story because the dove goes out from the ark. And when the dove doesn't come back, Noah knows that it's time to disembark the ark. Jonah means dove. And if you read Jonah, what, what Randall talked about is that the book of Jonah is preparing a place for Israel to land in the covenant judgment that the Assyrians are going to affect mm -hmm. on the northern ten tribes. So when you see Jonah going into Nineveh and being told to go into Nineveh, and on one level, that's what Israel's job was supposed to always be as the man who was to shepherd the nations, shepherd the animals, have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. Israel's mission was to be a light to the nations around them. Right. And does that right? correlate with so, the dove that settled on Jesus' shoulder when he, um, when God said, well, we're going to. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, we're going to get there. The baptism of Jesus has heaven opened and the spirit descends on Jesus amidst the waters of baptism like a dove. Hmm. Whenever you see the dove going out, you're seeing a work of God being prepared, a new work of God being pre prepared. So Jonah has this this idea of the sea and um, a preparation for Israel. And a lot of times these prophets are doing things. They're not just writing the story out, right? They're acting a story out sure. because they are representing Israel in themselves. That's how we're supposed to read these prophets. When, when Hosea, you know, Hosea goes and he marries the prostitute. What is that all about? Right. That's all about, it's all about <laughs> Israel. Right. right. Well, when I, Jonah, I, when Jonah's told to go, when Jonah's told to go to Nineveh and be a priest of God to the nations, right. that's what Israel was supposed to be. Now they had given that up because they had. Um, Jonah really shows you an example of Israel wanting to be an Israel-only theology, right? Mm -hmm. Because Jonah didn't want the blessings of God going outside of Israel. And he embodies the mindset of, of Israel in his day that actually led to their judgment. 
Um, and it comes up again in the New Testament because Israel didn't want to be associated with those yucky Gentiles, right? So there's a lot of stuff that can be learned from Jonah. Jonah's a dove, and he's going to prepare a place for God's people to land in Nineveh. And um, Randy talked about how Nineveh goes back to the flood story. They had a covenant connection in the flood story with Noah's son. And Jonah and Nineveh uh, continue in the story of the Old Testament because the prophet Nahum comes a, a little bit later after Nineveh goes back, reverts back to their wicked ways. And the prophet Nahum comes and he pronounces judgment on Nineveh for their covenant breaking. So the, the story of Nineveh goes a little bit forward as well. Now, I wanted to show... I want to show some of this uh, ancient literature. So, so Michael, why don't you pull up Jonah chapter 2, and I'm going to show you how a chiastic structure takes place in this account of Jonah's um, being swallowed up by the great fish. Uh, if you can pull it up on the, on the screen, Michael, we could read this. Sure. Do you have a third translation? Um, I've been using the New King James, but okay. uh, that's just what I, what I have in front of me. So. So Jonah chapter two, you know, after the story of the great sea, uh, the great storm on the sea. If you notice, um, this section is set apart as a poetic section, and there's a great chiasm here, in which ideas rhyme, and they work their way toward the center of the text, and that center of the text to give you an understanding of how chiasm chiasms work, the center of, t of the text is the highlight. It's the big kahuna. It's where you focus on. So Jonah chapter 2, at the beginning of this poetic section, verse, uh, verse 2, it says, and I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. That matches with, very, with uh, verse 7 where it says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Now, do you see how that rhymes? Mm -hmm. not, not in the sound, but in the idea. Crying out to the Lord, and then my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Mm -hmm. Now, the next, the next chiastic uh, point would be, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. Now, look back at verse 6, second half of verse 6. It matches. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. You see how that matches? Body, mm -hmm. Belly of Sheol, and then brought up from the pit. Now, continue in the text. It says, for you cast me in the deep into the heart of the seas. Verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed. So there's deep both in sea and the earth in the text. And that kind of rhymes with an idea. Uh, verse 3, it goes on to say, And the floods surrounded me, all your billows and your waves passed over me. Verse 5, The waters surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. You see that rhyming going on there? So you can read this passage in both directions, and then you come to the very center of the chiasm. Verse 4, this is the highlight. This is the focus. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. And the connecting phrase, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Is and as Lord Randy mentioned... That's the repentance of Jonah, hmm. right? That's where everything turns around in the passage. And by the way, um, this is this idea of looking again toward your holy temple. That comes up in the book of Daniel as well. In Daniel chapter 6, if you remember, he got into trouble because he opened his windows toward Jerusalem and prayed three times a day. Mm -hmm. These stories of Jonah and these stories of Daniel are connected. Um, in the story of Jonah, you have a death, burial, 
and resurrection. That's what the story of Jonah is all about, because in Israel's history, they are going to be swallowed up by the fish of the sea. Mm-hmm. And not just the 10 northern tr- tribes. This is the beginning of a new era in God's covenant creation. So the northern 10 tribes go into um, the dispersion with Assyria, but it wasn't that much longer until the southern kingdom gets swallowed up by Nebuchadnezzar. So all of Israel follows the experience of Jonah the prophet. All of Israel undergoes a death, a burial, and then a resurrection. Because we see in verse 10 of chapter 2 in Jonah, so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry. I mean, here you have, how does God do things? How does God create things? He speaks. And so that symbol, the symbolism in that Jonah text should really get you ready for this idea that God is going to speak to these nations, these fish of the sea. God's going to speak to Nebuchadnezzar. God's going to speak to Cyrus in the story of the captivity through the priestly ministry of the Adam priests, Daniel specifically. Okay, so the story of Jonah, of course, is used by Jesus Christ when he talks about his death, burial, and resurrection because the story of Israel is the story of Jesus. Jesus is the new Israel. So all this stuff is re, recapitulating. And what you have with, with uh, Jonah is the beginning of the story that we end up getting into with Daniel. Because Daniel chapter 1, you could pull this one up too, Michael. This is super interesting. Daniel chapter 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace. Now, in that text, the way it cadence works, the articles of gold from the temple match up with the fine young men who are taken into captivity from Israel. And a lot of people don't know this about the history of, of the Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem, but actually this is the first invasion by Nebuchadnezzar, and he left everything pretty much intact. He left the kingdom in Israel and the southern kingdom intact. In fact, there are three invasions of Judah from Nebuchadnezzar. And the history, if you put the chronology back all together, there's many years between the first one where Daniel and the young Hebrews are carried off and the final one when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and wipes everything out. Because of the rebellion of the people, they wanted to keep on revolting against Babylon, etc., against the word of the prophets, etc., But there is a big time gap, many years, between this point in Israel's history and later when Babylon comes in the third time and burns the temple and hauls off the rest of the captives. So in the story, Daniel is going into Babylon to prepare a place for Israel to land when that great sea creature swallows up the southern kingdom as well. Does that make sense? In fact, it's, it's pretty profound because by the time Nebuchadnezzar comes in the third time and destroys the southern kingdom, guess who his right-hand man is? By that time, Daniel had been elevated to the right-hand man in Babylon. That's why when they came in the third time, they knew to go find Jeremiah. 
they knew to pull Jeremiah out of the pit. Would they it be understood. erroneous? Would it be erroneous? I'm sorry, to, what was that? Just a quick question. Would it be erroneous to allude that to Joseph, where you see the Lord preparing a place for Israel in Egypt and seeing the, the similar yes, I, there? I believe all of these all of these stories are connected and obviously with dreams and stuff. Joseph and Daniel are very much connected in the messianic character of God. Now, I want to harp on this literature stuff again, because there, this is so profound. And because we read the Bible like modern, sort of like uh, modern scientists and just blaze through and find details, the mm -hmm. actual structure of Daniel is teaching something to Israel because they are going into captivity because they had broken covenant with God, right? Mm -hmm. They had rebelled against his commands and rebelled against they had, they, had, they had abandoned faith in him and wanted to put faith in the nation politically and everything else. All of these aspects were covenant breaking with Israel. Now, Daniel, the entire book of Daniel has 10 literary sections, and they're very distinct. And they match our chapter breaks for the most part until you get to chapter 10. And Daniel chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12 are all one unit, one passage. But the stories in Daniel, the book of Daniel, match up with the Ten Commandments. And each chapter of Daniel explains to Israel in their new circumstance, in their new creation, in this work that God is doing with the seed. How to be faithful to the ten words. So Daniel chapter one, of course, is the first commandment, have no other gods before me. And what did the what did the Daniel the Hebrews do? They won't eat the king's food. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter two talks about a graven image. Well, that's that's the dream of the metal man image. Mm -hmm. And what happens to that metal man image? Daniel chapter 3, do not take the Lord's name in vain. What does is, what is Nebuchadnezzar do in Daniel chapter 3? He built an image of gold to himself, mm -hmm. even when he was given the dream of the metal man image. Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, Sabbath rest. What does Nebuchadnezzar do? He gets haughty and proud and says, by my hands I have made this kingdom great. Hmm. And he's cut down. Daniel chapter 5. Honor your father and mother. Well, Belshazzar comes to the throne and he forgets all about King Nebuchadnezzar and he forgets about Daniel. In Babylonia, each ruler is considered the son of the previous ruler. Right. So there's the fifth commandment in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 6, you shall not commit murder. What's that story about in Daniel? Say traps. Try to trap Daniel and kill him in the lion's den. Hmm. Daniel chapter 7, you shall not commit adultery. And there's a vision of the four beasts. Daniel chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the goat. You shall not steal. Daniel chapter 9. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And what is in Daniel chapter 9? There's the prayer of the confession of sin of Israel. Daniel's prayer is a true witness to Israel's situation. And of course, the idea there is that Daniel chapter 9 gives us, you know, the 70 weeks pro uh, prophecy. So, even though Israel, after 70 years, is going to be regathered and placed back in the land, that great fish is going to vomit Israel back up in the land after 70 years. Daniel gives a vision of the 70 weeks, showing that the ca real captivity of Israel, the greater captivity of Israel, is going to last until the time of Messiah. Uh, Daniel chapter 10, 11, and 12, you have this, you know, you should not covet your neighbor's stuff 
And it's just one kingdom after another, stealing and taking and fighting. So if this kingdom rises and this king up against this kingdom, this, this sort of tumult, uh, which matches up with the 10th commandment. So I, I, I want to get through this idea of literary structure and literary uh, ancient literature is itself an aspect of what it meant to be a true follower of God and to meditate on God's word. It's not just a speed through for details. It has to do with the way it is constructed, the words it uses, the connection to the history, the context for all these things. Does that make sense, Michael? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, may I, may I interject? Um, Please. Does, yeah, sure. I like how you say, you know, how how they use the imagery of the, the fish swallowing, you know, the people, you know, right. things of nature. Does that correspond with, in Revelation, the Leviathan, the, the fish from the sea or however? Let, let me, let me, that's my next point. Edward, you okay, anticipate exactly where I'm going. <laughs> it's amazing. So, so Randall talked about how Jonah being swallowed by the fish had reversed the dominion. The fish of the sea had ended up with dominion over Jonah. Mm -hmm. Well, what Daniel shows is that when God's people repent and live faithfully, what does is, what is, uh, Daniel become? He becomes a lion tamer mm. with Nebuchadnezzar, right? Yeah. And he becomes a bear, a bear teacher because Daniel is teaching the second kingdom, Persia. All right. Okay. How to be faithful. Right. Mm. So, so now this comes up in really weird ways. Pull up on the screen, James chapter three. Um, this is going to sound really crazy, but I think this is the background. James chapter three. Okay. And he, this is James. He's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. So, uh, you know, James one, one says that's the context. So Israel the 12 tribes have been reconstituted in Jesus. James is written very early uh, in the early church, one of the earliest books that we have. So there's this, uh, if you look at Acts, there's this conflict within Jerusalem between those who accept Jesus and those Judaizers who reject Jesus. There's this big conflict about uh, this going on in the early church. Now look what James says. He says in verse, uh, in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. Now, here's the key, verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by man. Hmm. Now, is that talking about the pet store in the mall? <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> I don't believe that, that James is talking about the pet store in the mall. I no, think James is talking about the history me when of Israel. I travel. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men. Who have been made in the similitude or image of God. James is calling the Judaizers to be careful how they use their tongue. Hmm. Because it was though that tongue that set on fire in Jerusalem because of the persecution on the Christians, who were Jews as well. Remember, Acts says that some of even the priests believed in the early days of the early church. So, Edward, does that help you to see how this this imagery works? Sure. The context works. Yes. Okay. And I like how you use the Judaizers. You know, because I, I believe in which verse um, where it talks about it tame uh, tame mankind. Uh, the Judaizers would have tamed mankind using their law. But yet, you know, um, it's it's an unruly evil, you know, and deadly poison in a sense, you know, due to right. the fact that, exactly. you know, yes. Well, if I now may, yeah, if I may say one thing, what I see happening there, I might see it a little different. I see under the law, 
Israel was never able to walk worthy of teaching the Gentiles the oracles of God, whereas under the new covenant, where if we look at that, we know that Christ is victorious over the Leviathan of the sea. And in the new covenant, we are able through the word of Christ, through the word of God, yes. name mankind, teach the things of God, that it's not of ourselves, but that it's of Christ. And that's what yes. I see there uh, with the contrast. Well, certain, uh, certainly, certainly that's, that was the great failure of Israel um, as we see the story unfold. My only point is that with these stories in the Old Testament, there, there are glimpses or hmm. pictures or types of the new covenant, what's going to be unveiled ultimately in Jesus Christ. Does that Amen. make sense? I guess we're kind of, we're kind of in the same direction there. Oh, um, so we're kind of coming up, we're kind of coming up to the end of our hour here. And I wanted to say that um, I'd like to get back into Genesis chapter one, um, uh, perhaps another, another, another uh, show. But um, the, the biggest thing that I would want to say as introduction to Genesis chapter 2 and 3 particularly, we've already covered Genesis 1, I was referring to Genesis 2 and 3 specifically, is that there are a couple of assumptions that tend to blind people about what's going on the, in the creation, of te creation text. Um, one, if you just assume that it's raw history of material events, I think you're going to you're going to miss what creation is all about. We've seen that in Genesis chapter one. I think there's somewhat of that going on in the other chapters of Genesis creation as well. The second thing that is assumed, I think, that creates a lot of just just blinding um, blockages, is the idea that Adam and Eve are the only human beings involved in the story. Mm. Okay. And when, when my friend had asked me, is there any material about this prophetic covenant creation view of the seven days? You know, one of the problems is all of the Genesis creation material is based on wrong assumptions. And if you have those assumptions, you're really not going to be able to draw out the content and the meaning of those stories. And the sure. third... The third assumption is that the subject is cre the creation of the material universe. Those three assumptions will kill any particular proper understanding of Genesis creation. And, we, and they're not hard to understand because they're the very same three assumptions that, that blind people to fulfillment Amen. when it comes to Bible prophecy. They're yes. the very same blockages. So... I know that for some of these new people coming in and saying, what the heck is covenant creation? I mean, it may be overwhelming that this, these ideas that are being presented, it's like, where do you get that stuff? Like Randy said, you guys are, are, are nuts. <laughs> and, and I say, give it time. And I would, I draw the parallel, the analogy to, you know, when you were first investigating preterism or reading the book of Revelation and you had all these questions and stuff, you did none of those details found their place instantaneously for you. Right. It took a lot of thought. It took a lot of study. It took a lot of reading and it took a lot of time for those ideas to sort of gel and sort of digest into a usable form. I would argue for some of these new people that are listening to these shows, uh, do the same thing with Genesis. Just give it some time. Just look at them without those presuppositions that block understanding. One, that it is a raw history of material events. Two, that Adam and Eve are the only human beings involved. And three, that the subject of creation is the creation of the material universe. I think that'll be a good introduction if we're going to go further. Uh, another day into Genesis two and three. Yes, real fast, real fast just like the, the movie Doctor Strange, he was told, "Forget everything you think that you, that you think you know." So, in mm -hmm. other words, when you look at uh, right. the Genesis creation, you know, try try to forget about your presuppositions and things, and be open to try and understand, exactly. you know, what's being stated and what's being taught. Amen. Yeah.
Amen. Uh, Tim, if you don't mind, I'll unmute some mics before uh, we end again. We'll Absolutely. Be it's time. That sounds good. Okay. And I'll be in touch to uh, plan a day where we'll have you on. And we're also planning to have Randall Nuss on again this week and uh, to continue awesome. some conversation. So, uh, and, you know, I may even reach out to Norm Voss and see uh, what we might uh, be able to develop in that regard as well. So I'll keep everybody that uh, would be cool. to how we're doing this conversation, but I'll look forward to that. Unmuting some mics. If your mic is unmuted, please feel free to jump in with a comment, question, or concern. Zach, I see you're unmuted if you wanted to jump in. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, and thank good you morning. so much. Thank you, Tim, for uh, speaking with us this morning. It was great, as always. Um, what you're talking about towards the end is, you know, something I've struggled with a lot is that how, do, how is this going to be effectively communicated, not only to people who are predisposed to sure. um, this type of thinking and to, you know, intense study and very detailed study um, and in a culture that's sort of post poetic in some sense, um, yep. are there, you know, do you have ideas of like very practical, um, <laughs> steps to take even like individually, but also in communities of believers, right. um, to sort of develop this kind of mindset? Right. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I've done in my experience and with my children. I have nine children, four of whom are grown and gone, and five are still at home. What we do is I heavily emphasize the arts Amen. to them to get to get an aesthetic that's that that's helpful to them, not just not just to be productive and like, you know, make good money. Um when they grow up and get jobs, but to be the people of God who they are created to be. And so, for example, um, you know, with, with the book project, if, you re if you've read Beyond Creation Science, you know that the art is a really big part of that project. I was trying to model something with that artwork, and Jim Kessler is the artist who did all of the work. It was fantastic work. But I went to Jim and I commissioned those three artwork pieces. There's the artwork that's on the front cover. There's the artwork that's on the back cover, the ap apocalyptic vision. And there's another piece of art that I also commissioned with Jim, which was the covenant creation artwork, which is titled It's Kime. It's Kime, however you want to say it. Basically, the, the diary of God or God's divine uh, God's divine diary. And we'll talk about that art, but but I wanted to bring the artwork into a large emphasis with the book project because of this aesthetic issue that you mentioned. Now, with my kids, I do it a bunch of different ways, um, obviously with literature, but for example, most of my children uh, take karate classes as one of their one as one of their activities, um, because that that far eastern culture has a better grasp of those aesthetic elements, and so I'm just putting them into different situations as much as I can so that they can pick those things up. Mm -hmm. I mean, karate has like you know discipline, and there's a there's a there's a dance involved. There's katas. There's there's these routines you have to learn, and they're all connected to various things. So to answer your question, one of the big things that we have to do to see great power unleashed is we have to get out of a bare two-dimensional scientific mindset and enter into a three-dimensional artistic world. In a sense, that's just what the ancients were, because they grew up in the physical elements. They lived with very you know, natural things. That was their life. And all of their 
spiritual teachings come from that experience level. And that's an aesthetic. So I don't know if I can answer your question, but I can tell you what I what I thought about and kind of the direction that I've gone. And and this is a big area where the modern Christian church in America is in big trouble. There's no coincidence that we are not artistic people and that we don't understand scripture. Those two things go together. Mm. Amen. Well, that's I great. Do you um, want to follow up on that? Follow up on that? <laughs> I would think uh, consistency is, is, is vital uh, as far as, you know, studying, you know, the word and using resources and getting other ideas and other opinions, you know, like that and, and, and attending church and gathering together with other believers and things of this nature is very important and being consistent, you know, because you can't just develop a lot of this knowledge just by, you know, one sitting in, you know, one conversation, you know, is something that has to be ongoing. Amen. Amen. Amen, Edward. And that, I think that's the example we see in the Old Testament, because when you study the history of the prophets, they were prophetic schools. They were groups of prophets that lived together and studied together. Um, that's where, that's where, you know, even in the Old Testament, that's pr pretty, pretty evident. That's right. Yeah, you know, if I may just say uh, one thing I often, you know, I think we are one of our ethics here at the Blue Point Bible Church is to create, you know, be creative, to uh, have a constant curiosity, to be open minded and to be balanced. Again, some of the things that Tim had mentioned there uh, point to balance in our lives. You know, it's not just about cloistering up in a room, but also getting out and, and seeing nature and breathing in fresh air and doing new things. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of what I call discipleship here at Blue Point. We actually have a program we just did last night where uh, we, we strive to do extremely different things. So it, it might be, and many people think this is strange, you're going to go to a church and they're going to have you drinking different types of tea. Why? Because we want people to stay curious, to experience different things. And that way, when we're reading things that, you know, rather than forcing our presuppositions on things, we remain open to learning new things. And I think, uh, you know, it was Albert Einstein that actually had said, the important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. And I think uh, he, he understood this ethic that when we're open-minded and we experience new things and we open ourselves to the arts, I appreciate you mentioning that, Tim, uh, you know, read, I had thought when Zach asked that question, you know, one of the best ways we can encourage people toward having a better grasp of literature, particularly the Bible, is expose them to literature. <laughs> and, you know, that's Absolutely. one thing most people are missing. So I appreciate what you said in that regard, Tim. Exposure. Right. Yeah, not exposure. exposure. Right. Exposure. Amen, Edward. Exactly. And, and I'm, a, I'm a farmer, Michael. I, I work in agriculture and botany and things. And I can't tell you how many times that I've been actually working along on something, learning something about um, crops and seasons and things and realize, oh, that's, that's why the scriptures give that kind of explanation. Because I see, I, see, I see it out there in, in the garden. It's like, oh, that's how it works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's fantastic. I believe it. Zach, did you have anything else you wanted to ask? I trust we may have responded to your question well in that regard. No, you did. Um, I wanted to also ask you, Tim, do you, what connection to wisdom, the biblical concept of wisdom, um, does this covenant creation view have in the sense of, I, I see some parallels between sort of an emphasis in the biblical wisdom tradition and the, the ability to understand and decipher riddles and to a certain extent metaphors. Um, right. And, there, and it really does require, as you pointed out, a lot of patience and a lot of mulling these things over over a long period of time. Is, is there a connection that you see between, you know, biblical wisdom and your view of creation? 
So I think I think that I think that any discussion of that has to start with a contrast between a Hebraic understanding of wisdom and a Greek Greco Roman view of wisdom. Because in the Hebrew world, if you look back at Proverbs, wisdom is skill at living. Okay, it's it's three dimensional, it's it's incarnate in what wisdom means is skill at life. In the Greco Roman world, it was more about intellect and thinking philosophy. And if you look at some of the history here, it's sort of interesting because you know the Greeks viewed wisdom in terms of of logic and and thinking in such a way that they were passive to the world. They would sit back and and cogitate about the nature of things. The Hebrews were different. When they, for example, read the law, they were moving. Okay, they were. If, if, you, if you look at some of the ways it works in the Hebrew culture, the law possesses you and, and it changes the direction of what you're going. And so when you see uh, some people reenact this by having, you know, the, the, the Jews will read Torah and they will be swaying forward and backwards, right? That is this idea that the law is is animating you so any any discussion about this has to start kind of with those nuances from hebraic mindset versus hellenic greco-roman mindset which is actually very big in our culture but ultimately with covenant creation i think what i see with with it is it centers jesus christ and the work of redemption at the center in such an elevated way because he is the wisdom incarnate. You know, because when we read Genesis creation, we're we're going straight to the gospels, right? I mean, we're just it's like all of these connections, the apostles are using Genesis language in terms of Jesus and the unveiling. There's all this connection between creation and recreation in terms of redemption. You know, when you look at like dispensational futurism or young earth creationism, they have all of those subjects as completely disconnected from Jesus. Mm -hmm. So covenant creation is really recentering the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ at the center of all of our scriptures. Amen. And I think that, safe... I think that's progress. I think that's progress. Amen. Is it safe to say that, you know, the wisdom <clears throat> that we would like to possess is that of Jesus Christ in, in, in using his perspective and his way of life by following his example on how to live instead of intellectualizing things and trying to figure yeah. things out in ways that are reasonable and, you know, see, because when, when, when you get to... Um, into the ph philosophies and the things that are outside of, you know, Christ, you know, you get, you find yourself into that innate idolatry, you know, about, you know, how you see things or how things should work yep. according to your knowledge, you know, which, you know, is contradictory to, you know, following Christ in the way in which he would have us walk. Absolutely, Edward, I, 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 I want to reemphasize with the covenant creation view, we are we are consciously stating that Jesus is the wisdom of God Amen. in all things, in every way, Amen. and it's exalted above all things, um, and 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 the source of all things in life too. So yeah, I mean that's I don't know how to. How to go about that because it's a really big concept, but I, I really do think that covenant creation by by recentering the creation account in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in some respects, we may be just simply recapturing what the faithful Hebrew understanding has always been. Hmm. And I'm piggybacking on what he just said. Faith, faith is total confidence in God. That's right. You know, if I may say, uh, you know, one way that you could go about that just by simply reading through the scriptures is spending some time. I, I use this uh, acronym SOAPing, 
uh, scripture, observation, application, and prayer, spend some time reading through Philippians and Colossians. And I don't know how you cannot read through Philippians and Colossians and not see exactly what Tim had just mentioned as Christ being, you know, exalted as he who all things were created through, all things were created for. Uh, and one thing in regards to the wisdom you just shared, uh, coupling everyone's thoughts here, in Philippians chapter 2 particularly, uh, we read the ethic of what we're saying here. Philippians 2 verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So again, uh, hopefully we see that the humility and the servanthood uh, in the wisdom of Christ and what we're called to be in this world as individuals, as well as a corporate people of God. Amen. Zach, did you uh, did you feel that that was a good response? Did you want to have any more questions or comments? Uh, no, I'm I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for your good questions. I pray that uh, everyone was edified by the uh, responses to them, and that you were as well, of course. I see Vicky has her hand raised, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to maybe jump in and ask a question or make a comment. No, no question at this time. Just raising your hand for the fun of it. Okay, uh, thank you, Vicky, for being here. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being with us, Vicki. Um, okay, well, I wanted to just give everyone one last opportunity here to maybe ask a question or make a comment before we close out our program for the day. And again, we have a week of talking through these things, so should be beneficial. So is, so is scripture, observation, application, and prayer? That's right. Amen. Okay. As much as you wash your body, hopefully you're washing your mind. Amen. No? With the word of God. That's word right. Of, word Amen. Of God. <laughs> that's right. uh, well, uh, again, so you need water and soap and you need water and soap. That's right. You know, the, the word of God. Um, well, thank you, Tim, for being here with us today. Uh, again, you know, if I may just say some last things to everyone tuning into this program, the first thing I have to say is as we're talking about this, I hope you'll go back to the uh, blogs that we had uh, provided. And that's not so you would read our work. One thing I have to say, as we talk about this, I, I'm always astounded that People are entering in on this conversation, not making use of reading the book Beyond Creation Science. I want to exhort everyone, you know, go read the book. We have, it's for free. There's a PDF free on the WordPress, on the Power of Preterism WordPress site. Go read through the PDF because again, there's a lot of things that are brought up in that book. For example, the apocalyptic and prophetic uh, style of literature and how we see that in Genesis. And I thought those were two great chapters in the book, as well as the chapter that leans in on, on apocalyptic lifespans. I've seen some conversation about that uh, on social media. And I often think that the book said it very well. And if you would look at, you know, just what Beyond Creation Science said in that one chapter, and then also uh, go over to some other resources from men like that we've already mentioned here, John Walton, et cetera, you'll see where these things lock into ancient Near Eastern understanding and how oftentimes these numbers were apocalyptic, were prophetic, were exaggerated, if you will, uh, depending on, you know, again, I don't believe the Bible was exaggerating, but I do believe the Sumerian text was doing that for a reason. Uh, to, ex you know, exaggerate the lives of these kings to show something about them, to say something, which again, I think is what's happening in our Bible. And again, Beyond Creation Science, the book explains a lot of that. So I want to encourage people to go ahead and read the book, and it'll encourage you a lot and help you develop some of your, your comments and questions. Also, um, we've, we've put together these lists, and I've added the long lifespan, so we'll talk a little bit about that this week. And uh, there was one last thought I had written down. Um, However, I'm forgetting it. So tomorrow's Wisdom Wednesday. So perfectly, each of us will walk worthy of what was just shared there in regards to wisdom, that we would find ourselves not just sitting back and pondering things, uh, you know, and, and putting these things together, but rather asking ourselves, how are we applying this? How are we manifesting and bringing forth, uh, making known the manifold wisdom of God, the healing of the nations, and uh, praising God for that? So I look forward to leaning in on a bit more of this wisdom tomorrow. And I thank each of you for being here, fellowshipping with us. And of course, bringing forth some thoughts. So all glory to God. And if you don't mind, unless anyone has anything you want to say, I'll close us out in a word of prayer. Real fast, I would like to say that the Bible is not a divided book. It's, a, it's, it's, a one, it's one story. You can consider it a, a love story, a poetic story, but it's, it's one story. And if you look at it that way, you know, it may help you in developing 
your narratives and your understanding. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, brother. And same, thank same. You. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be gathered in your name this morning, Lord. We thank you for obviously technology and the privilege to connect Montana to New York and to be all over the place, Colorado. Uh, we're, we're everywhere today this morning, Lord. Uh, we thank you for that. We thank you for your truth continuing to man manifest itself, Lord. We thank you for being the truth. And we thank you for the wisdom that was provided this morning. We thank you for uh, the ethic of wisdom that we prayerfully see at work in our lives. And of course, Lord, we admonish ourselves to have the attitude that was that was in you within ourselves, Lord, that we would be a people of humility and be a people of service. Uh, go before us, Lord, and help us and, and continue to breathe this life upon us that we might be uh, further blessed and bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go Amen. God bless. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, brother.